Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's DCM Foundation webinar. We will be talking about DCM and heart transplant and hearing from three patients who have received heart transplants. We're just going to wait a few seconds here to let others join. And um, everyone's microphone is on mute upon joining. We do ask that you please put any questions you have into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, and so the more questions, the better. And uh, these are the people to ask. So. so we'll hang out here just for a minute and wait for others to join. For some people it's the, the dinner hour and uh, we'll just hang out here for just a quick second, let others join. Excellent, thank you again. For those who've just joined, um, you are here to see and hear about DCM and heart transplant, three patient stories. Again, everyone's uh, microphone is on mute upon joining. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature and you can do that at any point. Just drop your questions into the bottom of the uh, screen there and we will be answering those during the Q&A section at the end after the presenters um, have uh, done their speaking parts. Okay, let's get started. Next. For those who don't know, the DCM Foundation has a mission to, to provide hope and support to patients and families with dilated cardiomyopathy through research, advocacy, and education. Next. Again, we just remind everyone, please submit your questions. Uh, the more, the merrier. Just drop it in the Q&A feature of Zoom at the bottom at any point during tonight's presentation, and we will have a Q&A session uh, following tonight's presentation. Next. We thought it might be helpful. Oh, first, I should introduce myself. I apologize for those who don't know. I'm J.N. Rock from the DCM Foundation. I'm so honored to be here tonight with our, our three guests. Um, it's, it's really amazing to me to be here in the presence of, of three folks who've had heart transplants and just working with each of the speakers tonight to prepare for tonight's webinar. Um, I just wanna say it's, it's my honor um, to be able to work with them tonight. So let's uh, move on. Um, we thought it might be helpful to share some heart transplant statistics, uh, just a little bit of information for those who might not know. The first human to human heart transplant took place December 3rd, 1967 in South Africa. And um, today, about 3,500 transplants are performed annually worldwide with just over 2,100 of those being done in the US on average. There have been a total of 50,000 total transplants completed worldwide to date, and 30,000 of those were done in the United States. And this I found fascinating. 95% of US adults support organ donation, but only 54% are registered donors. So you will hear us several times tonight. Um, please, if you are interested in organ donation, please sign up and, and register. Um, that's the only way that people who need a heart transplant can get one. And um, we really need people's support so we will have a link at the end of the presentation where you can go to register if you're not already registered to do so. Um, and the last little tidbit here tonight, Spain has the highest donor rate in the world followed by the United States. Again, please encourage everyone you know to be an organ donor and we can all make a difference. Next. So we have our first poll tonight um, Heather is working with us behind the scenes. She's our Zoom expert. Um, and so she just put up the poll for us. Who's attending tonight's webinar? And please just click on what um, answer makes sense for you. Are you a DCM patient, family member or friend, medical professional or industry professional? We'll give it a few more minutes here. A lot of votes coming in, that's great. That's great, almost everyone has voted. Excellent. 
Um, so we can end the polling and share that. And we have, um, actually, this is great. We have um, a, about half our DCM patients and then another good section of folks are family members or friends, which isn't too surprising. And then we have a few medical professionals and industry folks on, so that's great. I think everyone will, will gain a lot of insight from tonight's webinar. So tonight we have three presenters. Caitlin Amos received her heart transplant back in 2018. And so really she's a, just over three years out from her heart transplant. Adam Burkhart has uh, just passed his 21 year mark having his heart transplant back in uh, September of 2000. And Greg Ruff, many of you may already know, um, he has had his heart transplant only three or four months ago. So in July um, of this year. So we'll be hearing from each. Um, and so let's go into a little bit more detail um, about the bios of each of our presenters tonight. First is Caitlin. Caitlin received her heart transplant on November 27th, 2018. She grew up playing sports and was diagnosed with DCM in 2007 while studying and playing soccer at Baylor University. After graduating, she moved to Charlottesville to begin her career. As a result of continued heart failure due to DCM, she received a new heart on November 27, 2018. Caitlin is now employed as a cardiovascular genetic counselor at Duke University Health System. Next tonight, we will hear from Adam Burkhart. Adam received his heart transplant September 14th, the year 2000. He was diagnosed with DCM at six years old and congestive heart failure at the age of 17. After a seven month long wait in the hospital, he received a new heart on September 14th, 2000. Today, Adam feels as healthy as ever. He is now married and the father of four children, two of whom have genetic mutations that can cause DCM. And our third presenter tonight is Greg Ruff. Greg received his transplant on July 15th, 2021, not long ago. In 2014, Greg was diagnosed with DCM and required an ICD. Through genetic testing, it was revealed he had three mutations responsible for his DCM. And a number of his relatives carry genetic mutations that can also cause DCM. After a period of worsening heart failure, Greg received a new heart July 15th this year. He lives in Dublin, Ohio with his wife, Brenda, of over 30 years, and together they have three grown children and two grandchildren. Next. So first up tonight is Caitlin Amos. Caitlin, um, thank you so much for being willing to share your story tonight. So I will turn the floor over to Caitlin now. Again, please put your questions in the bottom in the Q&A feature at any point tonight, and we'll answer those at the end. The floor is yours, Caitlin. Thanks, Jan. Um, my name's Caitlin. Like Jan said, I'm grateful to be here tonight. Um, and like Jan mentioned, I just celebrated my third anniversary post-transplant. But way before that, I grew up in Waco, Texas. Um, as my bio said, I loved being active as a kid. I loved playing sports. I ended up choosing to focus on soccer and was fortunate enough to get to go play soccer at Baylor. Um, that said, I didn't play a whole lot because within the first year, I started having some fitness problems. I experienced a lot of fatigue. I couldn't breathe when I was running. Um, I couldn't build stamina when I was training. And at that time, my symptoms mostly only seemed to show up when I pushed myself at like a high level of exertion, but they progressed to a point where I couldn't um, blame them on a lack of work ethic anymore. So I started seeing a lot of doctors and ultimately saw a cardiologist. Um, it was through that first cardiology workup in Waco, Texas, um, that led to my diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy, and I was 19 at the time. Um, next slide. So then it's just a quick run through of living with DCM. Um, I got a defibrillator implanted about a year after my diagnosis. I finished my time at Baylor being part of the team, even though I stopped playing around my sophomore year. I moved to Charlottesville for an internship after undergrad and ended up staying there for some years, um, during which I did experience a slow but progressive physical decline. Despite my decline, I feel like most of my years were DCM were still pretty full. Um, I think DCM felt manageable in a lot of ways, especially early on. 
Um, I learned to sort of adjust and uh, establish new normals or new baselines for my health and enjoyment. Like I really loved playing soccer with kids or coaching them. I liked going on hikes where I could pace myself pretty slowly. I still got to travel a lot and ended up even ended up going back to school to pursue a new career direction. Um, I was really fortunate to have like a robust community in that season um, with many friends and family members who cared for me well. So I attribute a lot of my capacity in the face of chronic illness um, to the help that I received in that season. And yet in all of that fullness and abundance, um, it was contrasted by my continually weakening body. Um, so my time in Virginia was simultaneously filled with lots of medical maintenance and some major medical events. Um, my, future, my future often felt really unpredictable to me and I remember carrying around a ton of uncertainty. Um, I had my first cardiac arrest in 2014 when I was playing soccer with some kids. Um, about a year later, I met a genetic counselor at UVA named Matt Thomas. And not long after that visit, I decided I wanted to become a genetic counselor um, and try to take care of patients the way Matt had cared for me. I eventually matched with a grad school program at the University of Texas in 2018 and moved to Houston at that time. Next slide. Um, surprisingly to me, the fall of 2018 ended up being a really quick sprint into transplant. Um, so I, like I said, I moved to Houston that August and I think the move plus just the typical stress and demands of a graduate program um, and unexpected extra device surgery were all cumulatively just too much for me and, and tipped me past the point of stability. I started having a lot of arrhythmia events and some arrests. Um, I was admitted in November 2018 and transplanted about three weeks later, which was all in the first semester of my grad school. <laughs> Um, I think I was thinking about this and I think transplant can kind of intercept our story at different times, um, both unexpectedly and much anticipated. But even when you've like known about it for 12 years, it still feels really abrupt and fast when it happens. Um, I can't imagine that ever really feels like the right time to have a heart transplant, but somehow in some way it is, it like has to be the perfect time. And that was true for me. Next slide. Post-transplant life feels more challenging to talk about. I'm, I'm just at less of a distance from it. And so it's a lot more nebulous. Um, even still, I tried to gather a few thoughts and see if I could frame sort of the good and the hard of it all. Um, so first and foremost, I think in sort of the, the challenging bucket, I would say that the road to recovery is pretty precarious. Um, healing is absolutely not linear and it can take many shapes and forms. In the first six months, my body was adjusting to a new life source, a sternotomy. My other organs were trying to remember what their job was. Um, it sometimes felt like just one big chemistry experiment in my body as medicine, medicines and medications were totally adjusted every week. Um, I had lots of blood work done, which I hated, <laughs> um, and lots of biopsies. And I personally lost a lot of my hair from immune suppressants, which was emotionally pretty tough. I waited about nine months to go back to school, um, but that whole first year often felt like one step forward, two steps back. Um, the first year in general um, is pretty regulated after transplant and that's out of precaution, but I had to think of it like a disciplined investment in a future opportunity and that required a lot of patience. Um, and then there was this trade-off I experienced. I remember this sort of cognitive dissonance I had of feeling healthier and sturdier and more alive while simultaneously becoming more vulnerable. Um, I think psychologically, transplant is a really intense process. I think that goes without saying. Um, and so it's been important for me to have outlets and spaces to sort through and, and process it. Um, poetry for me has actually been a really good outlet, um, but that's been in addition to having, you know, conversations with trusted friends and family members and even therapists. But there have been these different phases of, of, of grief and understanding that I've had to unpack in the last three years. Um, and then most significantly, I think the process of acceptance has been challenging. I think accepting the gift of someone's heart is like one of the hardest and most important parts of recovery. Um, it hasn't been automatic for me. It hasn't been a given. It takes a lot of physical, mental, and emotional work to fully accept and embody the gift of it. Um, it's like this, you know, this new heart is given to you, not just to use, but actually call your own. And that's just a lot to receive. Um, 
transplant isn't a cure. Um, I think we could all attest to that. You do trade in some old limitations for some new ones, but I think on the whole, it does open up more doors to possibility than it closes. Which brings me to my most hopeful message. Um, you can switch the slide. Um, but this, this brings me to the most hopeful message I wanna share and one that I hope the three of us can embody tonight. And, and that is that there is life after transplant. Um, and that wasn't always something I allowed myself to imagine. I had sort of scripted my life up to this point of transplant, but not really beyond it because it was just too much for me to grasp. Um, as I said, I took, one, I took year one pretty slowly, but after year one, life did get a lot better. Um, and some of the new normals post-transplant have been awesome. Um, for me, this has looked like running and being active again, graduating from grad school, being able to be at important events like weddings and funerals, and even pursuing an entirely new career. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I just finished year three, and I think at this point, I'm only regularly going into the clinic every six months, so I feel almost normal. I find myself not thinking about like Caitlin with the transplant quite as much, though I do have more visceral memory around the anniversary every year of my surgery. On the whole though, the maintenance doesn't dominate my focus like it did that first year. Um, so to wrap up, I think as you've likely perceived, both living with chronic cardiomyopathy and a transplanted heart has its significant challenges, um, but none of it diminishes, I think the gratitude I have for what I've been given and what I've gotten to do in all of those years. I think that's all I have to share. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I mean, it's, um, it's incredible. It's an incredibly moving story. And um, talking about processing the gift of the heart is, um, is something that um, I think, you know, is, is such a natural part of the process and um, probably takes a lifetime to really get your, your head around. Um, can you go to the next slide for me, Heather, for a quick second? Um, and I'm gonna ask each of tonight's presenters the same question. What is the one takeaway you would like people to know from your own heart transplant experience? I know it's hard to choose one or maybe two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I had a little heads up to think about this. We all had a little heads up to think about this, but um, like I said, poetry has been a really good outlet for me to sort of process and give language to what I've gone through. And so one of my favorite poems has this line um, that says, this is how the heart makes a duet of wonder and grief. Um, and I really held on to that phrase. I think it's just a really beautiful and succinct way to summarize transplant. Um, and so I think if I were to sort of translate that, my one takeaway is that transplant is just this incredible juxtaposition of something that's so, so hard and so, so good. And I think as a recipient, you get to learn how to hold that all at once. Um, so yeah. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. We really appreciate it. Um, and also, if, if people look back on the dcmfoundation.org website blog, uh, there, there is a story of Caitlin's story on there as well. Um, and so uh, I just want to remind folks to drop your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Any question you would like to ask any or all of our presenters tonight. Um, and again, Caitlin, thank you. And now we will move on to Adam and Adam's story. Um, again, Adam is 21 years out from his heart transplant. So it's interesting now you have, Adam, you have the, the time and, and the gift of time to kind of look back and maybe perceive things a little bit differently now, but um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jan, and uh, great job, Caitlin. Um, my story starts in uh, 1988. I was about six years old. Um, DCM has ran through my family um, for several, several years prior to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, we, uh, a lot of my family went to Nationwide Children's Hospital in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And we, everyone that was born to that time was tested for TPM1, um, some of the other genetic uh, variants that um, were known back then. And myself and several of my cousins were uh, positive for gene variants that caused DCM. 
And um, since then, uh, 1988 um, and so forth, uh, it was a very, very normal childhood. Uh, I loved to play golf, baseball, um, soccer, uh, basketball, um, just very active and very little um, limitations, just uh, occasional checkups with uh, the cardiology team at Nationwide Children's Hospital, um, who are absolutely great and um, just very, very normal. Um, next side, slide, please. Everything was uh, very normal until January of 2000. I was 17 years old in my junior year of high school at Bishop Rosecrans High School here in Zanesville, Ohio. And um, I was playing in an indoor soccer game. And <laughs> like Caitlin's story, it, we're kind of painting a bad picture on soccer, but uh, it's just kind of a coincidence. Um, I felt fine at the beginning of the game, uh, maybe a little tired looking back, but as the game went on, I just could not run, couldn't perform. I had no endurance. I mean, just nothing. And um, being a 17-year-old active um, young man at that time, I kind of thought it might just be my asthma. Um, I thought, just push through it. I'll go home, take my albuter, um, venolin inhaler. Everything will be fine. And um, as the game kept going, it got worse and worse. And my mom, fortunately, being a RN, she knew very well what was uh, right around the corner. Uh, so her and my dad loaded me up and uh, we went to the ER and um, they diagnosed me with um, heart failure. And after that, I was transferred to the Ohio State University Wexler Medical Center. Uh, Nationwide Children's did not have a heart transplant program at that time. So I was transferred to Ohio State and I was in and out of the hospital for a couple months. Um, Milrinone drips, um, other, they up Vasotech and um, other medications kind of helped at first. And then it just, nothing was really improving. It wasn't getting any better. And at um, one of my routine checkups, um, I remember the cardiologist, uh, Dr. Binkley, I remember this like it was yesterday saying it's time to get serious about a heart transplant and um, being 17 years old that was to that time the scariest thing I've ever heard um, you know you don't know what to expect and um, I had my bag packed uh, so did my mom um, we went into the Ohio State University Wexler Medical Center where I started a nearly seven month wait for my life-saving gift next slide please I um, went in, it was around March 10th, and uh, it was what you'd pretty much expect. No one enjoys being in the hospital for any amount of time, and especially not knowing how long until my life-saving gift would come. Um, you know, not going to lie, it was very, very scary. And uh, I had one dry run, I think it was around June or July, somewhere, it was in the summer months. Um, where they thought they had a heart um, available for myself. I, I was high on the list. I was a 1A. And uh, when the team went to, um, to um, recover the heart, they found that the entire right side of the heart was damaged. I, I don't know if it was from an automobile accident or what, but I was prepped, ready to go to surgery, and they said it wasn't going to happen. That was very disheartening, very... Um, yeah, for a back of, lack of better term, it was just kind of sad. Um, you know, obviously that person wanted to be an organ donor and his heart or his or her heart could not um, potentially save my life. And that was uh, that was a very rough patch in the uh, nearly seven months. But uh, nonetheless, just kept going, did um, heart um, did a lot of walks, a lot of rehab, just trying to stay active, stay strong. Um, watched a lot of Price is Right. Um, to this day, I still can't watch Price is Right. I watched so much. Um, I So fast forwarding to September 14th, I got the call at about two o'clock in the morning. Uh, the team came in, said they had a heart for me. 
I, uh, my mom only left my side, I think about three times in nearly those seven months. And one on September 13th, she actually went home to be with, uh, my two sisters and my, uh, brother, my four or uh, three siblings. And, uh, I told the team that, uh, is, have my parents been notified? And they said, yes, they're on their way. And Zanesville to Columbus typically takes about an hour. They were there in about 35 minutes. They, uh, they were very excited and worried also, but uh, had my heart transplant on September 14th, had my 18th birthday on the 20th and went home on the 21st. And um, for me, 21 years post-transplant, I feel great. I feel better today than I did yesterday. It just, it's been an amazing journey. Um, it's just, uh, it's amazing what technology and research uh, can do. And, um, you know, 21 years ago, things um, were different. And, you know, it's, it's going to be amazing what the next 21 years brings and 21 years after that. So it's, um, it's quite an amazing experience. Next slide. Uh, like I said, feel absolutely amazing. Um, like Caitlin touched on, there are limitations. Uh, I certainly have to watch cholesterol and um, sugar. Um, you know, obviously can't play football or anything like that, no contact. Um, but other than that, pretty much live a very normal life other than taking um, a lot of pills uh, twice a day, which uh, combats... Um, you know, organ rejection. Uh, I absolutely love to travel with family and friends. I love to play golf. Um, I married my beautiful wife, Kaylee, October 23rd of 2010. I work full time. I have four beautiful children. Um, my daughter, Quinn, she just turned nine. My daughter, Madden, is seven. And my wife and I, we also had a third daughter. Her name was Ro. She actually passed away two years ago. Um, she had dilated cardiomyopathy and um, we found out a new gene variant that wasn't testable back in 1988. Um, she tested positive for TPM1 and RYR2. And we spent six grueling days at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, I thought hearing the words that um, it's time to get serious about a heart transplant was the scariest thing I'd ever experienced, but that's second. This, uh, this was just, it's something no parent should ever go through. And, um, but like everything in life, you got to take, uh, kind of the good with the bad. And, um, if it wasn't for, um, Roe, passing, we never would have our son Nash. And, um, you know, I, we like to think is, uh, Nash was, uh, handpicked by our angel row and, um, you know, she gifted us another child and, you know, we think about her all the time, but we still have, uh, three beautiful kids living with us. So next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry, Adam. Heather, are you there? <laughs> yes. Are you not able to see my slides? Uh, no, we, uh, we're still on the life today. Adam's slide that says life today. All right. Give me one second. Sorry, everyone. No problem. I will say uh, while well, we get the technical difficulties figured out, um, Ro, even at four months old, was able to be a organ and tissue donor. Um, slightly um, bittersweet. There was no available um, recipient within the radius for her actual organs, um, which we were really hoping that from our loss, somebody else um, wouldn't have to experience it and that she would be able to save countless lives. Um, but that wasn't the case, but she was an organ donor through research. So hopefully the, um, you know, this science and everything is, they find something that will uh, help with, um, you know, 
finding a cure for DCM. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Um, yeah. Your story is so moving, and I apologize for the the slide deck issue. Um, I will I will share my slide in lieu of uh, Heather's uh, screen. I guess isn't working, so let me attempt to share my own screen here. Um, whoops, I'm so sorry here. Um, so this is this is the slide uh, that we were missing. Uh, can you see my slide, everyone? No, it's not up yet, Jane. Okay, I apologize. Um, well, we'll just we'll continue on, but um, and we'll share the the slide deck on our website um, after the event, so that everyone can see these the beautiful photos of your family. And Adam, your story is so moving, and um, um, my my heart goes out to you and your family. And certainly, you know, um, but I think the fact that Roe uh, was an organ donor gives hope to others and and her legacy lives on and in that there's um you know maybe some small small measure of comfort um absolutely and again if there's um one um takeaway that you would like to share with everyone from your experience or maybe two um what would those be my one takeaway it's and it sounds so cliche, but I think it's it's so true, and every human should feel this way. I, I certainly think uh, you know when you have such a um, um, amazing life saving event happen, your eyes are open to it and you realize it. Um, but it, like I said, it sounds so cliche, but you only live once and never take a single day for granted. Um, I think that is very important. It's certainly something my wife and I believe deeply in, and um, we implement that in our children. Um, take every day as a gift because it is. You never know what's around the corner. Um, it, it just every day is a gift, and I can't express that enough. Absolutely. Um... I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I know everyone's had different experiences in their lives and, and so forth. And it's something, you know, we forget about in our day to day, going to work, getting the groceries, getting home, yep. you know, getting kids homework done and all that stuff. But um, actually, Heather, thank you so much. Now that the slides are working, can you go back just one slide? Um, I just want people to or um, yeah, there we go. And this was the slide. Um, with Rose's picture and and her the story of her legacy. So again, thank you so much, Adam, for sharing your story. Uh, it's it's an incredible story. Again, um, everyone here tonight has a little bit different story, and I think that our audience can all take some measure of of comfort in understanding what you all have all been through. So thank you for your willingness to share your story tonight. Um, thank you. So let's move on to um, I guess it's slide twenty seven, Heather where we have one more webinar poll. And um, that is if hopefully the polls are working. Zoom was having some sort of a glitch apparently. Um, so next slide. Um, there is a poll we have to find out, and this is all anonymous, so don't worry. Um, are you a registered organ donor? Yes, no, or not yet, but I plan to register after this webinar. And um, we'll just post up the poll. Oops, that we need the second poll up. I'm not sure if the poll is working. Zoom is having some sort of an issue. Um, hang on one second. Again. Yep. Um, I see. Hang on one second. I apologize for this, folks. You know, we've done many of these and we hadn't had any of these issues before. So I guess Zoom was bound to have an issue at some point. Um, let's see if Heather can push that poll. There we go. I apologize. So again, are you a registered organ donor? Yes, no, or not yet, but I plan to after this webinar. And while folks are voting, uh, I just want to say one of the first things that I imparted in my daughter, who's now 20, but when she was 16, getting her license, 
I said, sign up, register to be an organ donor. It's one of the easiest, quickest things you can do. And it's so meaningful, it could save a life. Um, great, so let's end the polling and share. And this is great. So 76% of folks on tonight are a registered organ donor. 18% um, are not. And uh, there's a few not yet, but I plan to register after this webinar. So that's fantastic. And we'll provide a link after the webinar um, where you can go and register to become an organ donor. Great, so let's move on. And um, Greg, you're up next. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, so Greg Roof just had his heart transplant in July of this year. And so he's certainly earlier in his journey, but we would love to um, hear from you, Greg, a little bit about what you've been through and um, you know, giving some information for folks out there. Hey, thanks. Thank you, Jan. And thank you so much, Caitlin and Adam, for your story. Very, very, uh, very inspiring. Um, my story, probably a lot of you've heard this, so I won't go on forever. Um, yeah, I'm 57. Uh, my senior year in, in high school in, in track, I had a severe tachycardia event, had to quit track, uh, and um, you know, didn't run in college and, and, and didn't compete real seriously because of that. Didn't think a lot about it. You know, I, there, there was, you know, I didn't have a cardiologist. I knew there were some issues, but let alone more life uh, and um, didn't think a lot about, uh, you, know, you know, my issues. It certainly wasn't called dilated cardiomyopathy, um, whatever. So let, let a normal life. Um, uh, was getting a life insurance policy in 2004. And it, uh, normal, uh, an abnormal ECG came up. Um, they referred me to a cardiologist, uh, was really, you know, understood I had a 38% uh, ejection fraction, a uh, bit of a normal ECG, again, appeared healthy. I was still exercising a lot. And uh, uh, my cardiologist at the time decided not to do anything about it, but to watch me. Unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, and I kept calling the office and they said, well, if you're not having symptoms, don't worry about it. So, so fast forward then 10 years later, 2014, I was actually in the uh, cardiologist, uh, excuse me, I was actually in um, my allergist office for sort of an annual checkup. And he took my pulse and said, Mr. Ruff, your heart rate's 31 and very arithmetic. I'm going to call the squad. And I'm like, you know, I feel fine. We're good. So I did end up going to my doctor. Uh, that referred me to a cardiologist. I went to a heart failure center in uh, uh, late March uh, of 2014, just before my 50th birthday, and um, was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, um, had a 30% ejection fraction, third degree heart block, and, and left bundle branch block. Uh, and then that summer, uh, I had an ICD uh, implanted after experiencing several uh, VTAC a ventricular tachycardia uh, episodes. And at that point, my uh, ejection fraction had eroded to 20%. You know, real quick, I'll, I'll go over, you know, that, that's chronologically. It's interesting emotionally as, as we talk about that. Um, you know, at 18, I didn't really feel it emotionally. I had to quit track and that was the bummer, but I didn't think about my health. I don't think any of us do at that age much. I mean, Adam was forced to, and certainly Caitlin right was forced to, but, um, and, and again, in 2004, I was still healthy. I was fine. Um, we knew there were some potential issues there. Nobody seemed to be majorly alarmed about it. So I continued my life, not really thinking much about this. Uh, but then in 2014, when you, I was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, and they said, hey, Mr. R I was just a week, shy, a week shy before my 50th birthday, said, hey, Mr. Ruff, your life is is, is, you know, dilated cardiomyopathy. And I knew my life was gonna change forever. That was, that was a, a, a fairly difficult. And so, you know, again, went through most of my life not worrying about this and then, and then had to think more seriously about it, you know, you know, just before my 50th birthday. Next slide, please. Oop, might be, there we go. Uh, here's my family, my beautiful, wonderful family. I know a few of you are on today. Hope you don't mind me using your picture. Uh, but uh, some of my kids, uh, my grandson to the left, granddaughter to the right, uh, very, very, very fortunate to have a, a, such a wonderful and great family. Next slide. And as you probably could think, why is he showing the family? Well, DCM and my family, um, when I was uh, diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, 
was uh, idiopathic. You know, I was healthy. Why do you have this? Uh, through through a genetic test, uh, I was uh, showed that I had mutations of the lamin A331, 399, and TPM1. Um, and and I encouraged my family to get tested uh, genetically. And as I encourage everyone to get tested genetically, um, it, it may not save your life, but it potentially could save someone else someone else's life and your family. So I think it's really important that anyone with any type of cardiomyopathy get tested. Uh, when I was tested, I realized that two of the genes were from my mom, the Lamin 399 and the TPM1, and that one was from my dad, uh, the Lamin 331, which tends to be the disease-causing uh, uh, mutation. Uh, grandfather, father, uncle all died of these same related heart issues, but they were in their 70s and, and lived healthy lives up until then. When all the genetic testing was said and done, none of my family uh, members uh, tested positive uh, for, uh, for one, two, or three of all the variants. Uh, including all three of my kids and both nep nep nephews. Um, luckily, so far, no other of, uh, uh, of my living relatives have DCM. They have the genetic mutation. I'm not a doctor, but because you have the mutation doesn't mean you'll develop the disease. Uh, there's still a lot of research and testing why that's so, uh, you know, um, but I'm, I'm very fortunate that, that so far I'm the only one that's really, you know, had uh, advanced dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, as we look at emotionally, um, you know, it's a little tough, as Adam said, when you know that, that you know, you have this disease, uh, a lot more difficult when your kids uh, and, and potentially grandkids, nephews, other people in your family can get it. So I think, I think that was, that was rougher on me than actually being tested positive, the fact that, that it potentially could run through my family. Next slide. Uh, basically, and I'm going to run fairly quickly because we want time for Q and A. Uh, ejection fraction held uh, uh, 30 to 35 percent for about three years. Had some controllable VTAC, a tachycardia uh, episodes. 2018, uh, my ejection fraction went back down to 20 percent. My con my electrical con conductivity, my heart basically uh, was gone. And then I also had was having a lot of PVC. ATAC, VTAC episodes and was put on amiodarone to, to sort of quiet those. Again, went you know, along pretty well for a couple of years. Then the summer of 2020, uh, I had a severe tachycardia event requiring hospitalization. I was close to two days, my heart rate about 100, constantly 130 beats a minute. Um, a few months later, I was uh, hospitalized for congestive heart failure. Um, again, physically, I was still doing pretty well uh, in November 2020. My VO2 max, which I think is an indication of physical capability, uh, decreased from, from a previous test in 26 down to 19. So I knew I, knew I was slipping and, and slipping fairly quickly. Um, and that's when we had beginning discussions of a, of a heart transplant. Uh, real quick, and, and um, you know, again, you know, it, it, it becomes more real emotionally uh, as mentally. As you get closer, when you have that first discussion, as Caitlin Adams, you know, said, it's it's uh, it, it grabs your attention, uh, you know, about hey, we're getting close to a transplant. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2021, uh, this year, uh, in May, I was I was listed on a transplant uh, list as a status six. I don't think we have time to explain it today, but if you have uh, cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and you, you think about transplant, it'd be good to go online to learn about the different statuses uh, uh, of, 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 of heart failure or transplant list uh, and how that works. Pretty interesting. Um, you know, the, the higher you are, the smaller the number, the higher you're on the list, the quicker you get a heart, basically. So uh, I, I had worsening heart failure symptoms in July 1st. I was upgraded to status four. I was hospitalized at uh, OSU uh, Ross Heart Hospital here in Columbus. July 6th, I had some uh, severe tachycardia reoccurring events and uh, was elevated to a status two, went on a balloon pump uh, and waited for a for heart. They told me on status two, it normally takes seven to 10 days to get a heart. I got, uh, was identified a heart on the ninth day and transplanted and, and, and transplant, on the 10th day. So, and I received my heart transplant on July 15th, uh, four, four and a half months ago. So next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, first, I'd like to say, uh, and I hope I always say, you know, thank you. Um, certainly, thank you to my family, 
Thank you to my friends, uh, colleagues. They were they were wonderful support in getting me through, and uh, and also very much thank you for uh, the OSU Ohio State University Heart Ross Hospital, uh, top to bottom. Everybody I dealt with, I was in the hospital for twenty four days. Uh, I had a great experience. They were a very very skilled and caring group of people, and I definitely want to thank them. Um, I was discharged on July twenty fourth uh, and went home. It kind of goes together, I guess. Um, and I began uh, physical therapy uh, right after, probably four or five days after being discharged. I started cardiac rehab six weeks after, uh, began working part-time uh, eight weeks after, um, and everything looks good uh, on a follow-up test so far to date. I think I've been pretty lucky at this point, quite honestly, I've been pretty healthy. I'm four and a half months out. Um, I still get really, really frustrated that I'm not completely healed and cured yet. I have to have patience. I'm not good at that. And thank you, Caitlin, Adam, you know, helping remind me that I need to have that, that patience. Uh, so, but, but it's tough. It's very difficult. Um, it's doable. Uh, but, you know, anybody can go through it. Anybody can be successful. Uh, but but it, it, is a, it is a difficult process. Jay, next slide, please. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, you know, we've we've watched your journey this summer. Um, it, it's very inspiring, and, and we're so glad to see you here with us tonight. Um, and again, the same question I've asked the other presenters tonight. You know, what are the one or two takeaways if you could tell folks um, based on this experience that you would that you would like to tell others? Yeah, I, I think again, it's, I've done some videos for the foundation, and and not to be too repetitive, but I think it's about preparation. Um, if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, heart failure, um, you know whether you're headed to a transplant or not, um, it's really, really important that you you prepare yourself. I think you have to prepare yourself physically. You need to be as healthy and as fit as possible. Um, the journey is much easier, uh, can be much easier, should be much easier if you do that. Uh, the, the, you know, your body withstanding the, the actual surgery and the recovery. That's very, very important. Second, I think you need, you know, develop emotional support, family and friends. That's really, really, really important. Um, you know, we all need that. We certainly need it when we're facing, you know, a, you know, a chronic illness and in, in, in a, in a very, you know, uh, 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 you know, major surgery like heart transplant. And then the third thing is I think, you know, prepare yourself, um, you know, spiritually, no matter what your your background is, religion, faith, non-faith, or whatever, um, I think you have to be prepared uh, to 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 be okay with whatever happens, uh, and, and and have that peace. Uh, I think that's really really important. So again, uh, we'll go to questions, but I think preparation is really really the key, and I think a, a big part of 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 why I've done so well. So fantastic! No great advice. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, Thank you to all of our presenters tonight. We're gonna to go to a Q&A session now. Uh, again, if anyone has any additional questions, just drop them into the Q&A feature at the bottom. We do have some here that have already come in. Um, this one, um, you all describe an emotional roller coaster at times during your journey. Um, and if you could each, you know, for a sentence or two, tell us what helped the most during these times. and. Um, you know, maybe, and if you want to all unmute yourselves, uh, that would be great. Um, we can start with Adam, if you want to go first. What's what's helped the most during those roller coaster emotional time periods? Like Greg was saying, um, having a great support group around you certainly helps. And um, although, you know, my time in the hospital was lengthy, I look at the positive of it. It was mainly over the summer months. So my siblings were off school and could be there with me a lot. My youngest sister, Jenna, um, she was very young at the time. She stayed up there a lot with uh, my mom and I, and that certainly helped me. It certainly helped my mom. Um, just having a great support group around you certainly makes it easier. That makes sense. Um, Greg, Caitlin? Caitlin? Yeah, I'll just, I mean, I think we'll probably all say similar things, but I, I agree with the the support, from, even from a 
especially from a relational standpoint, being the most <clears throat> significant factor in um, weathering the up and down or sort of the oscillation of emotional and physical um, changes. I think, yeah, I, I had people literally and figuratively kind of carry me through pre and post transplant process and um, incredibly dependent on many different relationships. I didn't have a significant partner at the time and don't now. And so I had this like very kind of beautiful constellation of, of people um, show up and participate in, in the caregiving in an immediate way and then sort of in a long-term way and that I, I couldn't have done it without them. Um, on a really practical piece, I was thinking about this, but, and I don't know that this is like advice, but I think one way that I was able to get through it on my own is sort of short frame versus long frame. And I think like knowing and believing that like what doctors and other patients are telling you that after a year and years down the road, it gets better. You feel normal. You feel better. You actually feel um, just like more alive than you have, like holding to that. But on the day to day, like shrinking my focus to like, what is the next thing? Like just limiting it to um, very small, very, very small scope of today. Do I have blood work today? Do I have an exam today? Do I have an assignment due? Like what is, what is the immediate next thing? And that next thing and next thing and next thing just carried itself to, to getting through, I think. Greg, do you have anything to add? Uh, you know, again, I think you're just echoing what they said. I know we're kind of, you know, late on time, so I'll keep it short, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I always say control what you can control uh, and let go of the things that you can't control. And it's, it's about one step at a time when you're in the, the middle of the river. I used to always just say, hey, let's get to the other side. Let's just get to the other side. So. So I echo, I echo those, but we, I know we got a lot of questions, so I'll cut that yeah. short. No, that's great. And I just want to um, say, um, Chris on here uh, has commented, he had two heart transplants 25 years ago. And again, three years ago, after wearing out his first heart, he said, I agree completely with the inspirational speakers on focusing, taking it one day at a time and living life to the fullest. Each journey is different and there will be bump, bumps in the road. So mentally prep yourself. Uh, so that that's great advice. Um, let's go on to another. Um, Greg, how are your children monitored for DCM since they um, have tested, you know, positive for <clears throat> genetic mutations? No, that's great. Uh, uh, great question. Um, so all three of my kids, the, the protocol they're under right now is they got an initial uh, ECG. Um, they wore, I think, a 24 hour, maybe a little bit longer, Holter monitor. Um, hmm and then echocardiogram, uh, and they're followed up uh, with, uh, at Ohio State Ross uh, every couple of years, and it tends to be a uh, ECG echocardiogram, um, and through uh, a research study that uh, Dr. Hirschberger is doing at Ohio State, they actually were able to get a free cardiac MRI, which is nice. So it, it, it's a couple, you know, it just, it's, it's not that difficult, it's not painful. Uh, it's every couple of years, they just, they just have to be checked. To make sure the disease doesn't doesn't start, so Excellent. makes sense. Um, maybe this is for um, for you, Adam, and then Caitlin. Does the scar irritate you a while after tran post transplant? Um, you know, an interesting question um, because uh, Al, uh, this is from Alexis, uh, who says my nine month old is about two and a half months post transplant, and she's always scratching at her scar, which sounds like of course, it's it's probably healing. Um, what's your experience with that, Adam, and, and then Caitlin? You certainly have a scar, and I can say, you know, when any any time the body is healing, it does tend to itch, especially something like that. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a battle scar. I wear it with pride. It never, you know, doesn't physically bother me. Um, that's a, that's a good question. And, um, you know, when you're going through something like this, there truly is no dumb question. There's, you know, a lot of things to worry about and, mm -hmm. um, that no, I, I, I really didn't have very, uh, very much difficulty with, uh, my scar at all. And Caitlin, um, I think physically I, yeah, it heals in different ways. There's some itching. Mine, my scar is still tender. If something, um, just maybe underneath, like on the sternum, if something is like specifically pressing against it, 
or like very particularly pressing against it. Um, so there's a little tenderness. Other than that, I don't think there's a lot of physical, I guess, residual effects from it. Um, it was interesting, and this would probably be different from a nine month old, but I, psychologically it was hard for me for probably almost the first year to look at my scar. Um, and I'm, I'm past that now. And I think it was part of that sort of acceptance mm -hmm. process. Um, and I'm, I'm with Adam at this point that it feels like sort of a badge of honor, but there was a psychological piece for me. And I, um, that might or might not be true for someone that has that scar at an earlier age, but I think it will become physically normal, I'm guessing, or, or, or desensitized over time. And, and Greg, not to leave you out, what is your, you know, you're just four and a half months out here. What's your experience with this? Um, it, it, it was interesting. I mean, I, I felt those things a bit. It, it was never a real issue. My sternum never hurt. Uh, the scar was never, bother, was never bothersome. But again, you know, I think everyone looks at my scar when I go to checkups, like, oh, it's great. It's wonderful. So, so I think I've been spared, you know, you know, you know, a lot of those issues. Big difference at 12 weeks. There was tenderness, it moved, there was all that stuff. Up until they, they say 12 weeks, and at 12 weeks, I mean, it kind of went away, which is interesting. So that's great. Jan, could we, and can you guys, could we go maybe five, 10 minutes over? People want to drop. That's great, but we have a lot of questions and would love to answer the questions. Adam and Caitlin, are you good with that? And, absolutely, yeah. And, yeah, absolutely. And if, if you need to drop, drop, but I think this would be great. I, I hate to leave people hanging, so. Um, and so let's, um, so Caitlin, let's start with you with this one. Um, were any of your symptoms misdiagnosed, especially in your youth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, <coughs> most of my symptoms were only present. I think, like I said, at a high level exertion and, and to be honest, I don't know when they would have been died or I wouldn't want to have discovered cardiomyopathy if I wouldn't have been playing soccer and trying to push myself at that point. Um, but I, I had no family history. I had no like personal history prior to that of any sort of respiratory or cardiovascular concerns. And so for so long, it, we, it was um, it was some sort of like chronic bronchitis or asthma. And I did all sorts of inhalers, kind of like Adam said. And um, I, from like really far homeopathic medicine to really far Western medicine, like just did a lot of different tri trial and errors um, before we paid attention to my heart, which feels a little weird to say at the time, but um, definitely had asthma diagnoses and other respiratory diagnoses prior to cardiomyopathy. Interesting. Um, Adam, were you, were you misdiagnosed? I mean, your mom was any, a doc, I mean, a, a nurse, so she yeah. right away knew stuff was serious. Yeah, um, no, I don't think I was ever misdiagnosed with anything. Um, it was pretty, looking back, it was pretty painfully obvious what was going on. Um, you know, Greg touched on the um, ejection fraction, uh, the EF um, numbers. And at one point when I was at uh, the OSU Wexner Medical Center, it, my my EF was between one and seven, and um, oh my god, you know, it, yeah, they uh, they just, you know, I think my case was very. Wow. This is what's going on. This is what needs to happen, and there was really no opportunity for a misdiagnosis. That's incredible. I, I can say I've never heard of an ejection fraction that low personally, but it, that's incredible. I don't even think they rank it or scale it that low anymore. They just say below 10 or below 20. But I remember uh, the cardiologist saying they were estimating it being between one and seven. Wow. Wow. Good grief. And Greg, did you want to answer that question? Yeah, I think it clears my story. Uh, undiagnosed, maybe not misdiagnosed. And I think one of the things that the foundation wants to tackle is that it's such a high percentage of people with dilated cardiomyopathy are, are either undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. And that's a huge issue. And so, you know, that's something, a big issue the foundation wants to tackle. Um, you know, how do we improve that? How do we get people to the right doctors, to the right heart institutions? Um, and and how, do we, how do we increase awareness, so. No, excellent. Um, have any of you had issues with infections post-transplant um, and, and this also goes along with um, rejection. Has anyone had any issues with post-transplant? 
I never ha have had or have not had any like um, significant rejection. They sort of uh, graded on a scale and um, I've always had between like one and zero, which is considered not concerning. I did have, I, I, I had two rehospitalizations within my first two years after transplant. One was for actually um, dehydration because of some of the medicine I was taking. It was really hard on my kidneys and um, that was not an infection, but it was sort of a, sort of a post-transplant complication. And then about a year later, I, ha I got like a, an E. coli infection. Um, I don't know how, maybe so, like eating out or something, but was, was readmitted for that. And anytime you have an infection because you're immune compromised, it's a pretty big ordeal. And so um, I was in for like another week as they were troubleshooting and monitoring me. Well, uh, Greg, have you had any experience? With that? Uh, no and no. Uh, so far, I'm early on. Uh, so far, I will say. Okay. All right, great. And, and Adam? As far as rejection goes, no. Uh, like Caitlin was saying, my, all my biopsies have come back zero or ones, uh, nothing concerning. Uh, been very lucky, but also have certainly kept up on my medications, taking them when I'm supposed to and take what I'm supposed to. And, um, you know, I think a, a lot of that is owed to um, having very good biopsy reports. Um, as far as rehospitalizations, I spent a week at uh, Duke Medical Center um, with cardiac tamponade. Um, something happened um, with my heart and there was two and a half liters of fluid in the pleural cavity and had to have an emergency pigtail drain put in to drain that fluid and had a uh, pericardial window put in to where the fluid around the heart can basically leak into the pleural cavity and uh, the body just naturally gets rid of it. But outside of that, no rejection. And that's been my only rehospitalization. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great to hear. Um, let's see, we have some other questions that have come in here. Um, this is for you, Greg, specifically. It says, thank you. Your grit is amazing. Can you tell us more about your recovery to date, how it feels physically and emotionally? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the grit coming out. If it's true or not, I, you know, sometimes I think I'm just too dense to realize any difference. So, so uh, uh, thank you. It, it, you know, it, it, um, it, it's, it's, it's difficult, right? It's, it's the recovery has gone really well for me compared to the, I think the average has gone really, really well. And I'm very blessed and very uh, fortunate uh, uh, for that. Um, but, you know, it, it's tough. I mean, the medications are tough on you. It's tough to sleep uh, the first month for me. Um, you know, the medications are difficult on you, you know, certainly with COVID and everything else, I've got to be careful what I do and who I go around and that, that's going to be for a while. Um, but, but, you know, the company, I mean, I'm, I did a 12 minute Bruce, uh, treadmill test yesterday, four months post transplant. I think that's good. I don't know. I'll find out next week when I go to the hospital, but, um, so, so, I, so I've been very blessed and very good. Um, my frustration is that it's not perfect and that's not completely done. And that's mentally, this, what's sort of been bothering me. Um, everyone, Caitlin has told me, Adam has told me, guy, dude, it's six months to a year, maybe a year before you really get back. And I've got to get that in my thick head, you know, before I start doing silly things and hurt myself again. So and I can tell Dr. Hershberg is smiling and laughing at this point because he tells me that probably once a week. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. um, oh, thank you for sharing that. And, and, and it's important to too much too soon. Um, um, Caitlin, this one's for you. What did your decline feel like? And can you say more about the day-to-day -day challenges physically and emotionally of your recovery? Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I think those are sort of two parts, but my decline, um, I had, so I had dilated cardiomyopathy for 12 years before my transplant. And I think there's different iterations of what that decline felt like and looked like. And I think at the beginning, it was, it was disconnected. Like I only felt those symptoms at high exertion. And so it was probably a lot harder to like accept and receive and, and believe that I had a heart problem um, when I didn't have day-to-day -day symptoms. And I think maybe four or five years in, I started to, to feel, um, 
heavier, like I was retaining more fluid and a little more fatigued and shortness of breath would like happen. Like I couldn't take a deep breath quicker, um, but still on the whole, didn't feel it. I think my, my first arrest when I was playing soccer was one of the first events that made it super real to me that I had a fragile heart and, and not a super strong heart. Um, and then I'd say my last like two or three years before transplant, um, those symptoms I had experienced at a high level exertion were like manifesting at a, at a very day-to-day -day basis. Um, I was, I would mostly just physically and mentally very fatigued, kind of foggy brain, um, would need to sit down a lot. I, um, I was just more swollen. Like I, I think I could kind of hide my fluid. It wasn't, it wasn't like, um, in obvious places, but I, the congestion, like, as it sounds like felt real, like on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, I would feel the level of con congestion. Um, so I think that's probably how I would describe it. And, and just needing to like check into the hospital more often having more kind of arrhythmias at the very end. I think, I think the very last stretch you're, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming that Adam and Greg can attest to this, but those very last few months before transplant, you are very aware of your like fragility and, and sometimes like wondering if you're going to wake up, which sounds pretty intense, but you, you just, you're just aware of how kind of fragile everything is. Yep. Um, the recovery for me, what was the question? Just sort of the, how do I, how did I navigate that or? Yeah. And the emotional aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I don't I don't know that in my recovery I can disconnect emotions from body. I think you are so in your body that whole first year that it's all tied together. And so if you're not sleeping, like Greg said, that is like emotionally very frustrating. And if you have a great day at cardiac rehab, you feel like this is it. This is what everyone's been telling me. I'm alive and I'm strong again. And a day later, you have a complication with a GI or um you realize you're losing hair. And, and I think just the whiplash of that is both emit, like emotionally and physically very, um, you know, it's very discouraging. You, you're, you just kind of roll with it, the, the, the back and the forth. And so um, I think, I don't know if I'm being repetitive at this point, but just no, navigating, no. navigating, navigating that for me was really um, just to reemphasize like one thing at a time and to hope in the long game, but not, not try to conquer it all um, that on a Monday, <laughs> on a Monday, just be like, how am I feeling today? And, and be able to attend to that and share that with some people. And on a Tuesday, if I feel great, then I can push myself a little bit more. Right, no, thank you so much for sharing. Really, it's in incredible to hear everybody's story and takes on this. Um, uh, this, this next one is for Adam specifically. Adam, uh, it's a, thank you for sharing your incredible story of courage and grace. Is there any particular advice you can give to encourage people to live each day to the fullest? Oh, um, embrace family, embrace friends. Um, you know, they're the most people, important people around you. Um, don't take yourself too seriously. I mean, I know, again, that sounds cliche. I think everything in this, um, you know, category that we're talking about, um, you know, that especially this just sounds very, uh, you know, cliche, but it, it's, it's honestly the truth. And, um, you know, laugh, have fun. When, when, when people say laughter is the best medicine, it truly is. And it, uh, it can completely change your psychological aspect and outlook on things just by laughing. You just feel so much better. Um, but yeah, just certainly, Embracing family, friends, and laughing is, uh, I think, very good ways to um, improve your daily, daily lives. Jeff Davidson from Healing Hearts of Central Ohio said, Adam, having 20 years post-transplant is an incredible heart success story that would inspire all heart patients. Um, so... Uh, thank you again for sharing. Um, there's a question about uh, just asking if each of you has been genetically tested recently, since there are a lot of new mutations. Um, and uh, if, if, I mean, I know each of you had talked about some of the genetic testing, how recently, I guess, if you're comfortable answering the question, if not, that's fine. 
but um, you know, how recently have each of you been tested because there are new mutations coming um, that we're becoming aware of all the time. Um, Caitlin, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think my last time to have full testing was um, 2017, I had a very big panel and had zero variants. So, um, so unclear if if there's something in 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 my genetics we still haven't picked up on yet or not. But interesting. Okay, yeah. uh, Adam. We just um, were retested again in 2019 after uh, our daughter passed away. And it turns out that my side of the family was aware of TPM1, which was obviously still within my DNA. Um, it came to light that my wife um, was actually the carrier of RYR2. And those two together, the way we understand it, was a perfect storm for our daughter, Ro, um, our oldest daughter, Quinn, she has both and our son, Nash, he also has both and they um, require um, trips to Nationwide Children's Hospital every six months. Um, Nash, just his echo, EKG, everything looked great just last month. So he's cleared for a year. Quinn's, um, on the other hand, they wanna watch her a little more closely and, um, so she has to go every six months, but um, yeah, we were just tested uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so I, you go to our website, you look at the testing. Uh, we have a tab, genetic testing at the top. Um, we've got a partnership with an organization. I was actually uh, able to go online anonymously, order a test, I think it was two, $300 mail it to me, and this was a year ago, spit in the tube, shake it and send it back. And I was able to get a full cardiomyopathy panel um, very inexpensively. So it, it was about a year ago and had, had two conversations with the genetic counseling uh, online, you know, like this. But uh, so, so I think it was about a year ago uh, was, was my last genetic test. So it's easy to get genetically tested. Again, I keep pitching for that. I know we got to go, uh, but I think everyone should encourage, uh, you know, to have their cardiologist or doctor order a genetic test. Uh, if, if you, if you have cardiomyopathy and it's idiopathic, and, uh, if not, I do believe there are places you can go online and do it yourself also. So and it's, it's, it's getting less and less expensive and less obtrusive. So. Excellent. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, maybe go to seven fifteen. Is that all right with everybody? I got three more minutes. Yeah. We'll just yeah. wrap up here. What, why don't we make this the last question then? Um, <laughs> Um, Caitlin, what have you learned as a genetic counselor about DCM? That's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, the like variability of it was the first thing that comes to mind. I, I, that's a question that I guess I don't know how to specifically answer, but the variability of it, like the different ages that it presents, the different way it looks, what it overlaps with, um, genetically and phenotypically it is just this it's just this wide spectrum um disease and what, how it shows up and so I think you know I up until this point knew sort of a narrow experience of it which was my story and that's like grown and grown and grown and grown and I think now that I'm actually working um with patients with BCM they're literally all shapes and sizes stories um underlying etiologies, like it's, it's such a wide variety. So I think, I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but that's, that would be how I would respond to that right now. I have one more thing to say about that actually, just also, and this is probably both in my experience as a patient and a, as a provider, but in the variability of it, it it's often, also hidden, I think, is, is an interesting thing about DCM is until someone is, is severely symptomatic, um, it's a hidden disease <laughs> and, and it's a hidden condition. And I think that is, is challenging as a provider and it's challenging as a patient to sort of navigate and live with and care for. And so, um, yeah, I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm learning every day, I think, how to do that better. Awesome, thank you, thank you so much. Um, 
thank you all for sharing your incredible stories. We're so glad you could all be here tonight. Um, we, we just want to remind people, and if we can go back to the slide deck for a quick second, um, we just want to remind people not only of our website address, which has all kinds of information on it, dcmfoundation.org, and please also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We have weekly updates on, on all the platforms. Um, but we, we want to really encourage folks, um, if you are not currently a registered organ donor, please visit organdonor.gov. These three people sitting before you tonight would not be here if it weren't for someone who you know, signed up as an organ donor and uh, decided to give that gift of life. Try to you know, talk to your family, your friends, the people on the corner, anybody, um, and get folks to sign up because uh, without that, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to sit here with these folks tonight. And I really love this last quote. Um, this was from Caitlin during an interview we did with her several months ago, which you can find on the blog on our website. But Caitlin had said, imagine every life as a story. Your choice to be an organ donor allows someone else's story to be sustained. You can choose that. You can choose that at 16. And I just thought it was beautiful and powerful. And uh, again, so please do go and register if you haven't already done so. Um, and hopefully we will see you next month and we'll go to the next slide. Um, please hold the date. Our next webinar will be held Wednesday, January 19th at 6 p.m. And the topic is living with DCM from a patient's perspective, kind of like how do you live day to day uh, with DCM. So it should be interesting. Um, and we will be sending out information about that in the next week or so. Um, and the recording of this will be made available in the next couple of days. Any questions we didn't get to, we'll review them and we'll go through and, and hope to answer those for you as well in that follow-up email that we'll send with the webinar link. So again, thank you to everyone tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you to Heather behind the scenes. Uh, we pulled it out of the ditch there with the Zoom issue that we had. So, so that's all great. And I hope you all stay safe, be well, and maybe we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Take care. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.